Good morning and welcome to the VLV Spring Conference. I'm Colin Brown, the, the chairman of the VLV, and it's great to see so many of you here today for this conference. The theme today is protecting the citizen interests in today's broadcasting market. We believe the citizen interest is extremely important. There's a lot of focus on the consumer and the market-driven consumer broadcasting market. And the VLV feels that important that the consumer is, it's also extremely important that we don't lose sight of the role of broadcasting in civil society and of the interest to citizens. So that's the theme for today. Just before we get started, the normal announcements. Um, there are safety exits as marked and follow the instructions in the event, in the unlikely event of an emergency. So now to the first panel. <coughs> as you can see, we've got a distinguished panel and here to introduce the panel for our, our first session on politics on TV and radio is an equally distinguished presenter, chair, commentator, Torren Douglas, very well known to VLV, a great friend of the VLV, a regular at these events. He was, of course, for, for many years, the media correspondent of the BBC, and is now continues to be one of the leading commentators on media issues. So Torren, great to see you, and it's over to you. Thanks very much, Colin, and good morning, uh, everyone. It's been an extraordinary time in UK politics, in some ways unprecedented, and that means it's been an extraordinary time for the broadcasters who've been having to cover events. From the Scottish independence referendum in 2014, through the Brexit referendum in 2016, and what was meant to be a two-year countdown to the UK leaving the EU in March, it's been a fraught time for the politicians and the broadcasters. It's been exacerbated by the rise of digital and social media and economic pressures on the mainstream media, particularly local press, which has led to cuts in budgets for journalism. And as ever, when the nation is divided, the BBC finds itself under attack from almost all sides. So in this session, we're going to ask, how are the broadcasters doing on radio and television primarily, but also the web? And what can be done to ensure they do it better as the political disarray continues? And we've got an extremely well-qualified panel to discuss and debate the subject, not to mention, obviously, a very well-informed audience, and you, of course, have views of your own. So um, our first speaker will be Dorothy Byrne. She's the head of News and Current Affairs at Channel 4. Uh, since uh, she's been there, they've won numerous BAFTA RTS Emmy Awards. She's made a Fellow of the Royal Television Society for Outstanding Contribution to Television uh, and uh, RTS Journalism Awards as well. She's a trustee of the Ethical Journalism Network, a former world in Action producer and editor of ITV's The Big Story. Uh, next to her is Mark Damazer, who is the Master of St. Peter's College, Oxford. Before that, he spent 25 years at the BBC, finally as controller of Radio 4 and Radio 7, which is now Radio 4 Extra. He was previously Deputy Director of BBC News and held lots of the top uh, posts in BBC News. Uh, he actually started at ITN as a graduate trainee before joining the BBC World Service, and he's also been a member of the BBC Trust. Finally, Polly Toynbee uh, is a columnist for The Guardian and has been for many years, but she's also a former BBC social affairs editor, and she's won national press awards, and she's written numerous books. So it's a great panel. Um, as I say, we will be uh, hearing from them shortly for a few minutes. They will be setting out their view of the current situation. I'll then ask, ask them a few questions from here, and then we're going to open it up to you for your questions and for your comments. So without further ado, um, Dorothy, how are the broadcasters doing? What do you want to say? I have two very brief points to make. Firstly, I believe that an obsession with due impartiality by radio and television journalists during the coverage of the referendum campaign meant that they failed properly to carry out their duty to investigate the true facts that we needed to know. Secondly, now I am genuinely very concerned that when we have to listen to people wittering on all day about how they do and don't agree with each other on the minutiae of what they're trying to sort out about Brexit, I'm very concerned about the stories we are not hearing. And, uh, as a result of that, I'm going to give away most of my speech to somebody that I think you need to hear from. She's sitting here now and she's going to come up in a moment. 
Her name is Mimi Mefo. Mimi, by chance, came to live in my house when she had to leave Cameroon uh, after, as an outstanding young television journalist there, she exposed a murder by the government and was imprisoned. But I'm the head of news and current affairs at Channel 4, and I didn't know what was happening in Cameroon until she came to live in my house. And this is exactly the sort of story we're not hearing now. So I want Mimi to come up now and tell us about the horrors that are going on in Cameroon that radio and television journalists ought to be reporting. So Mimi, Mimi. please come up. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good morning once again. Thank you, Dorothy, for this wonderful opportunity. I'm going to be very brief, like you said. Cameroon is actually uh, an African country in Central and West Africa, because when you look at the geographical location of Cameroon, it's in Central and West Africa. We are a member of ECOWAS, and we are equally in the Gulf of Guinea. So that's where it's located within the African continent. Uh, Cameroon is a former British and French colonies. That's, it was colonized by Britain and France, meaning that we have two official languages, English and French. For the past three years, Cameroon has been facing one of the toughest moments of its political history as the people of the southern Cameroons, that's the English-speaking population, who are the minority. They are estimated 8 million out of the 28 million people in Cameroon are demanding for secession, and they want to be independent. They want to be independent because for more than 50 years, that's more than half a decade, they have been complaining about gross marginalization. They have been complaining that their rights are not being respected, and they don't feel that they belong to the Cameroon that they came together with. I mean, by the time they were joining uh, the French part of Cameroon that was in 1961. So for the past three years, it's been very, very difficult. The political atmosphere has been very, very hostile for journalists like myself. It's been difficult even for politicians. It's been difficult even for the common man. Now, these two anglophone regions, because we have just two regions out of 10, uh, English speaking, a lot has been going on for the past three years. I'm talking about close to a million IDPs already in Cameroon. For the first time in the history of Cameroon, we have more than 200,000 people, refugees in neighboring Nigeria. You know, Cameroon has a history of harboring refugees from neighboring Central African Republic and Nigeria, where we have the Boko Haram insurgents, and from the Central African Republic, where we have the Seleka rebels. But for the first time, Cameroon now has refugees in neighboring Nigeria, which is a very, very uh, funny picture, as I can put it. Now, we have a lot of young girls and boys in bushes because they are afraid of being attacked by the military because the government of Cameroon has actually deployed thousands of troops in these two Anglophone regions of Cameroon when the Anglophone crisis, which is now an armed conflict, became uh, what we see now because many young boys whose families were shot, whose relatives, mothers and sisters were shot, decided to take up arms against their own military. That's the scenario that we have in Cameroon now. So we have so many non-state armed groups fighting against the Cameroonian military. Close to two, at least 2,000 people have died already, according to a crisis group, which is not even having the possibility to go to the field now. An estimated 1,800 people have died within these few years. So if you look at these figures, and imagine that in the next one year or two years, we'll be talking about close to 5,000 and plus deaths in Cameroon. We have hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of children who have not been able to go to school. That is the most depressing part of the situation. Because of this conflict, gunshots, kidnappings, even in the school milieu, more than 200 students, you wouldn't believe, have been kidnapped, I mean, once by some of the armed groups and taken to unknown destinations. So the academic atmosphere is very, very unfavorable. Children can't go to school because of gunshots. Uh, we have women who are in bushes. Many are widows because their husbands have died. We have many of them displaced. So many children cannot go to school. We have loss of lives on a daily basis. We have soldiers too who have died because the victims are on both sides. And that is the picture that we have in Cameroon today. What I, I noticed as well, like Dorothy said, 
is the international media has been doing a lot of COVID. Just recently, the government of Cameroon banned the Human Rights Watch from visiting Cameroon to cover human rights abuses. The story of the Southern Cameroonian people are not being told at all. And I said it when I was receiving my Index on Censorship Award, that the Anglophone crisis is highly underreported. Many people are not talking about it. We, the journalists on the ground, we can't talk about it because we are intimidated, harassed on a daily basis, and we need that assistance from international media and the press to highlight what's going on in Cameroon. I'm not worried about the political atmosphere. I'm worried for the civilian population dying on a daily basis, suffering the consequences of this ongoing war that was declared by the President of the Republic. If we can come together, maybe talk more about what's going on in Cameroon, I think it's going to help. You can help the press in Cameroon. It's a very hostile environment for journalists. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. And um, one of the questions I was going to ask is what's being squeezed out by all the Brexit coverage. And I will ask Dor Dorothy what she's planning to do about that at that, um, uh, at that stage. Uh, Mark Damas is, uh, is going to speak next. He recently wrote an article in Prospect, which some of you may have read, headed not dramatically at all, could Brexit break the BBC? The tensions, the bewildering question of balance and how to get it right. So uh, he's got that in five minutes. Uh, thank you. Um, I mean, on the, very briefly, on the Cameroon point, um, I suspect it speaks to another VLV concern, which is the reporting of the world outside the UK or uh, Anglophone North America. And I don't know that the story has been particularly squeezed out because of Brexit. Uh, I say with some sadness, it might not have got much coverage with or without Brexit. Uh, but on Brexit, um, so, I mean, let me begin with a very obvious point, and I'll try and rattle through this in bullet points in, in five minutes. Um, the BBC, great and powerful and wonderful as it is, uh, is not the Financial Times and, or the New York Times. And I mean that the expectations of what BBC quality journalism looks like need to be framed by the banally obvious sense of what the medium is and what its grammar is. And what the BBC does uh, is an act of compression of an awful lot of information which it then has to make into something electronically sensible for multiple audiences. That has always been the case, and it applies to Brexit just as much as it applies to any other story that it attempts to do. So when people complain that they didn't get enough of this and they didn't get enough of that, uh, they may very well be right, but they need to be understanding of the compression that's at the heart of the medium. Uh, on the impartiality point, I, I sort of I think I disagree with Dorothy, but not necessarily completely. I think that the debate about the BBC's coverage uh, has focused too much on impartiality and not enough on quality. Uh, they're related, but they're not quite the same. I think the BBC gets a fairly difficult rap uh, about its impartiality performance when I think, both as a practitioner and as a trustee, broadly speaking, with some obvious exceptions, which I may have time to come to later, I think the BBC did fine. Uh, it's not a popular view, particularly amongst Remainers, but I don't think that there was any obvious systemic bias or even systemic set of fumblings uh, as between the Remain and Brexit camp. Uh, I think what happened was a real sense of shock in the political system around the fact that there was so much more exposure of the Brexit cause than had previously been the case because inevitably, as was the case with other broadcasters, it was broadly understood that it should be 50-50. But that does not mean that the BBC was guilty of false equivalence and that every claim made by each side was treated as equally wise. Uh, the economy, which in the end may not have been anywhere near as decisive as people thought, is the case that most Remainers bring up and around the 350 million. Uh, I can't say that it never happened, but broadly speaking, the BBC was perfectly able to point out that the 350 million was a nonsense figure and was also able to point out that most economists felt that there would be severe economic impact of Brexit, and I thought that was well done. Um, uh, the spearhead of the BBC's journalism, a, a third point, remains broadly as good as it ever was. I don't think there's any quality problem with Laura, uh, with Emily Maitlis, or with uh, Martha Carney, and uh, Nick Robinson, and Mark Mardell, and I mean, these are all really deeply, deeply splendid people. I've had the privilege of working with a lot of them. And thank the Lord, the BBC, not only the BBC, there are other splendid broadcast journalists around, but the BBC is still able to get enough talent uh, 
into its central nervous system to produce very, very high quality material from those journalists in particular. Uh, that's not the problem either. Um, so what do I think is the problem? I think that there is a small c conservatism in the way that the form and the grammar of TV and radio, particularly TV, but TV and radio works. Uh, there is a statistical thinness uh, and a lack uh, in mainstream coverage with big audiences of a proper rigorous scrutiny of statistical argument because people think that the audience is going to be bored by statistics and we haven't found an effective way in broadcasting, but it's the BBC's particular responsibility to graft a thorough interrogation and understanding of numbers into its mainstream journalism. Uh, there are pockets of brilliance here and there, more or less on Radio 4 is the most obvious example, but actually it's not yet penetrated the bloodstream of main mass audience broadcasts and it needs to do so. And then if you go to the principal currency of daily current affairs, in one sense magnificent in the UK that we have such a culture where people are expected to come on and be Humphreys or mate list or whatever, but the fact is that those interviews need a little bit of reconsideration because in the rush to get to the next headline and to cover the waterfront uh, in an interview, there is not enough pausing and stopping about things that are said that are implausible and don't stack up. So I make this in a non-partisan way. Every Secretary of State for Health who has come on to the Today Programme or Newsnight or Channel 4 News has made the claim that in real terms, NHS expenditure has risen year on year. Uh, and they will say, this shows you how virtuous our government is. This statement is entirely true. There have only been two years since the beginning of the NHS when that's not been true, but broadly, it's always going to be true that the Secretary of State can make that claim. It is, of course, nonsense. Uh, in the context of uh, growing population, rising cost of medicine, expenditure per head, it is simply not true. It's not negotiable, it is simply not true. It's even more the case with expenditure per head in school pupil terms. Now, when somebody says that in an interview, they need to be stopped, and the other parts of the interview need to be put to one side in the interest of proper scrutiny and subverting the expectation of both the interviewer, the interviewee, and the audience. Uh, now, when it's done enough, the press officers who brief the cabinet ministers will know they can no longer get away with saying that because they're gonna get hauled up and stopped. Now, it requires bravery and experimentation, um, and a bit of failure needs to be built into it because it won't always work. So my final point comes back to quality and not impartiality. The, in the interviews that are done are perfectly impartial. They're good at doing it, and it's all fine. But there needs to be some rethinking to get to what the BBC should really be doing, which is higher quality journalism. I rest at that point. Thank you very much. Thank you. And obviously we'll pick up um, lots of, uh, of those points. Uh, Polly. Well, I strongly advise you to read Mark's uh, excellent piece in the uh, uh, Prospect magazine. He's, he's given a, 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 a light resume, but uh, there's a lot more in it. I think the BBC, I'm going to talk mainly about the BBC because I think they're the ones who really come under pressure. Channel 4 gets away with wonderful things that the BBC probably wouldn't get away with, which is what makes Channel 4 so watchable. Um, I mean, the BBC is the nation, represents the nation. It's what the nation is proudest of together with the NHS. It is part of our patriotism, part of our sense of identity, and the pride in the way, it, how trusted it is when we travel abroad, and foreigners mention not just our football teams, but the, uh, the BBC, and it is soft power worth uh, a thousand nuclear submarines. Um, but that's, of course, why it's attacked. It's what makes it vulnerable, because it is this, this emblem. And so it is always going to be pummeled and questioned. Um, in a sense, the only benchmark we have of what is fairness is the BBC's editorial guidelines, if you get your hands on it. Uh, and so, it, of course, it's going to be contested, because no such thing exists anywhere else. And it is, of course, under huge ideological attack and has been for decades for different reasons, for simply the Murdoch reasons of people who don't believe there should be a public broadcaster at all. It's mostly won that argument, but it is always in peril from that argument. Uh, now it's the uh, quite gratuitous attack on the uh, making BBC pay for licence fee for the over 75s and uh, taking large chunks out of the BBC, which is, of course, nothing whatever to do with the deficit. Um, and so Brexit was bound to, to test it almost to destruction. I think it survived. I think I look at my inbox every day, and whenever I appear on the BBC, the rage and fury from both sides of Brexit, Broadcasting Corporation and all of that, 
whether it's Adonis or the other side, it's pretty much equally on both sides, but it doesn't mean it always gets it right. It reminds me very much, though, that it has always been the case when Mark and I were both in the newsroom, 1996, leading up to the uh, general election of 1997, nightly rage in both ears from Peter Mandelson and from Alistair Campbell, knowing that if you leaned hard enough and shouted loud enough, you could intimidate the news editor of that bulletin, and they always seemed to get an advance on what the running order was going to be and shout and yell and hope to move their item up or down or out or wherever it was they were campaigning for. So it, it is um, an ongoing tactic. And I think to some extent those who shout loudest do sometimes win over in the BBC's decision making. Simply the fact of the overwhelming number of right-wing newspapers looking in the morning, how, how have we done with our agenda? Is it sort of roughly right? Is it the same as the newspapers? is a great risk because the newspapers as a whole, apart from The Guardian, of course, are no guide as to where you are on that difficult white line of have we chosen the right agenda for the day. I think Mark's idea of reality check and more stats is a very, very good one. I think people like it. I think they like to know the facts. I think they, they do protest at facts that go unchallenged because they're not sure if they're true or not. And I think it'd be very good at the end, at the end of every relevant bulletin up came uh, a trusted independent non-BBC fact checker uh, to say, on the whole, this true, that true, that one dubious, uh, and so on. I think on Brexit, the point I'd really like to make is the long-term failure of all broadcasters and all of the media in this country to cover Europe, and not just to cover elections. You know, there's a tendency to say, oh, look, is, is Angela Merkel in trouble or not? Uh, how's Macron doing if there's some sort of crisis or the Gilets jaunes or something like that? There will be occasional dramas. Very often, if you look at the foreign pages of newspapers, they're sort of ooh ah gee whiz stories that have nothing much to do with about the nature of the country, but some particular murder accident event that happens to have taken place in those countries, and that counts as foreign news, which it isn't. Um, wars will get through, mostly during bank holidays, um, when there's nothing much going on here. Um, it's difficult to know how many wars to cover, and I think on the whole, television news does well at keeping Yemen going and keeping our awareness of, of quite a lot of scenes of horror. I'm sorry, not Cameroon, but um, point well taken. But what we need to know is how it, that the Germans, the French, the Italians are very like us. They are tackling with the same things that we're tackling. And when we, when we talk about health or social security systems, we should be automatically comparing it with them so we know where we stand. So we're not somehow uniquely puzzled by what to do about an aging population. And that constant comparison and using people from across Europe would have bound us in and made us feel that we are part of a broadly social democratic entity, struggling with broadly the same democratic systems, problems about how much tax to raise, not raise, how to spend it, all of that. How different it would have been if the last 40 years that had been the sort of coverage that people expected to see, and how much more familiar Europe would have felt, as opposed to always, we're going out to fight them with our red lines, um, which has been a disaster. It has been what a previous, uh, DG called a bias against understanding very often. I'll just finish up with a wonderful phrase that Mark uses in his piece. He talks about, he says, well, the problem is, what do you do if a majority of the population suddenly find they believe that bananas are blue? What do you do? How do you report it? Do you report it fairly? You say, yes, they could be blue, they could be yellow. Um, or do you go on saying, I know the majority if you think that bananas are blue, but they're not, they're not, they're not, they're not, which is, I think, how we should approach what I hope will be the next Brexit referendum. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> So we've had two very strong defences of the BBC. I'd like to come to uh, Dorothy because you were mentioned with a slightly um, side swipe. Uh, no, not swipe. You praise. Were, yeah, praise <laughs> for Channel 4 because it's not the BBC. It can do things the BBC doesn't do. A, do you think that's fair? And B, what have you been doing that's different from the BBC? How have you been trying to get it right on I, all of I this? I think um, I'm always struck when I hear people connected to the BBC um, talk about this lobbying and I'd, I'd just like to pick that up for a moment. I mean, I actually, I think that substantially on the main points 
that we're discussing here today, I think we agree. Um, I was often asked in that era of Alistair Campbell used to ring me, well, he never had my phone number, and I, I wouldn't have given it to him. But if he had, I wouldn't have taken the call. We didn't have mobiles in those days. Oh, right, OK. <laughs> but I, I'll just it tell... Folk sticks, I, I'll, yes. yeah, you know, I'll just say a, a story very briefly, that I was contacted by some people who told me that they... It was a lord, and he said that he and some friends of his regularly met the BBC several times a year to speak about their views about Israel. And I said, well, who are you? And he said, well, you know, it's myself and my friends. And I said, well, I can't go about meeting a man and his friends. And, um, and he said, well, we always meet the BBC. And, you know, we object to some of your coverage of Israel. And we regularly tell, have we, he told me that he had meeting dinners with the BBC and told them this. So I, I said, well, I don't want to meet you. I can't go around meeting all these people. And he got very angry and he actually complained to Nick Toon, who's going to be here later. And in the end, I said to this bloke, I, I'm a single parent, so I can either meet my daughter or a whole load of men and their friends. <laughs> so I made a decision, I'm going to meet my daughter. But in fairness, I did make a film, Dispatches, Britain's Israel Lobby, and I got in touch with him and I said, thanks very much. I would never have had the idea of making that <laughs> film if you hadn't rung me up. So I would say, you know, don't take calls from... I, I know you come under pressure at the BBC that we don't, but, you know, I say to people, you can write me a letter. Yeah, what is all this on the phone and meeting you? Um, but anyway, but I, I, I think in... On the whole, we, what we all agree on is um, we need more statistical analysis, better understanding by journalists of um, the, you know, maybe we need to appoint a lot more journalists who studied economics, although I'm not sure economists have saved our country, so I'm slightly torn on that one. Better understanding about trade, um, you know, that. Um, we've got to face the fact that life is very, very complicated and just reporting what people are telling us or doing exciting interviews in such a complex world is, isn't enough. Does Channel 4 get attacked from both sides in the way that the BBC does, do you think? Do you know, because although we are a public service broadcaster, um, people don't pay for us. Um, they, a, a lot of people don't even know that we are theirs, but British people, and I admire this, feel if I pay for something, then, uh, you know, I deserve a say in it. If I'm with somebody from the BBC and they get a first-class train, I get really annoyed, especially when I get the second-class train, although they've sorted out that train issue a bit. But whenever I see wasted by the BBC, I literally go, I paid for that. And, um, but you don't pay for Channel 4, and, and we were set up to be different, and I think people understand that. And, you know, one of the things we do, we have an hour a night, and that enables us to do, um, you, you know, in-depth coverage about parts of the world that other people don't cover. So I, I often feel sorry for the BBC, because they're, they're getting attacked for financial reasons, when actually a lot of the allegations about them not being duly impartial really don't stand up. Thank you. So the panel don't think uh, the attacks on the BBC um, about its impartiality over Brexit stand up. Well, Can no, I... not... Not all of them. No, OK. Not but broad, I'm not that broad, kind. Broadly. <laughs> um, can you put your hand up if you think the BBC was biased over Brexit? In that case, I think we don't need to go... Oh, that's that, that, I mean, <laughs> that, uh, that removes... Oh, good old Peter. I'll come to questions at the moment. I mean, it's just questions there. I thought there might be more criticism of the BBC from the floor, and if you want to express that in questions rather than hands up, uh, do. How do you answer, um, Mark, um, you shouldn't take the calls? The BBC should not take the calls, should not meet these people? Yeah. Um, uh, the anthropology of the BBC, it, it projects to most of its competition 
um, a sense of imperialism, um, huge, grand, swathed in self-conscious history, the elephant in the room. Uh, inside the organization, it's more or less constantly on the verge of having a nervous breakdown. Uh, and these two anthropological traits live side by side. And it's absolutely true, Dorothy's uh, intuition, that the BBC tends to meet people. And you know, I used to think I got 90% of the salary for doing the job and 10% for holding my temper and being polite when I actually wanted to hit somebody um, who was complaining, in my view, in a way that was unreasonable, whether it was a political spin doctor or a House of Lords lobbyist or, or a member of the public. So the BBC does do that. But there are really quite strong antibodies in the BBC that protect it from having too many lunches and then just caving in. Uh, the tradition uh, of uh, engaging is too deeply rooted for anybody to do what Dorothy would do. Um, but I would resist the notion that it's contaminating. I think it just adds complexity and frustration and levels of patience and resilience which are necessary in order to endure it and to come out with proper journalism on the other side. But I don't think it characterizes the BBC. Brief moment, I think the Channel 4 News is a totally magnificent invention. Uh, has been all the way through. I adore it and love it. Uh, but it's also not doing the same job as BBC Mass Bulletins because its audience is much smaller uh, and it has a different approach to the way a daily news uh, agenda is pleased together. And you have to ask yourself the question, if the BBC broadcast Channel 4 News and didn't have the rest of it, would it work? And I think it doesn't. And to some extent, Channel 4 News exists in its absolutely brilliant um, a, a, and brave space because there's something else somewhere else in the public sector or in the public service broadcasting that does it differently. Thank you very much. We um, mentioned, or you, you mentioned, and I was going to raise anyway, we've been here before in terms of the time that uh, Mrs. Thatcher was there. We've had uh, Tripoli, uh, Kate AD, Norman Tebbit. We had the Falklands. We had the Gulf War. We've had Iraq. How is this different, or is it different, or is it just more of the same? Polly, how does it seem to you? For... Yes, it's very different because it feels to be more about the people. It was a referendum. There is uh, a sense that, you know, the 52% should be in charge here, and um, it's not just about what the politicians are doing. So I think it's much harder to respond. I think it's harder for everybody. I think it's harder for politicians to respond. I think it's harder for all journalists to respond because you're arguing with um, a great mass of people. And it's, um, so it feels to me far more painful and far more difficult when people say, we're right, we had a vote, that's the end of the matter. It is undemocratic even to argue any further. And the amount of rage that that sentiment uh, generates is quite phenomenal and beyond anything that I've ever seen. And indeed, you know, one MP's been killed for it. It's, um, it, it is a real belief that democracy itself is being denied, um, which I would strongly contest, but that's a different matter. It's, um, that's why it's fiercer, I think. Thank you. Dorothy, how do you see it in comparison with those previous spats? Um, well, I think a real difficulty that we have and have had for since the vote is how you cover something when you don't know what it's going to be. So, um, because I look after both news and current affairs, lots of companies pitch me ideas, um, sort of what if ideas, you know, if we have Brexit, if we have this form of Brexit, um, will this happen, will this happen? And the difficulty I have is, I have to say to them, I don't, I, I don't know, and you don't know, so I can't make that program about your thesis that this would happen because you don't know. So we are covering something all the time that we don't know what the consequences of se the several different options are and that must be that's very frustrating for us as journalists i think for viewers it was very frustrating and we went through a period where our viewing figures fell because i think people just felt it's going on and on and i've no idea what anybody's talking about yeah. 
Has it come up again? I've been yes. back in two Yes, days. it has. Mm. But I think the reason it's come up again is it's an emergency. Mm. It's, it's literally like the days when there might be a snowstorm or um, a flood, everybody turns on. So some nights we've had really great viewing figures and people have said to me, haven't we done well? And I've said, I don't want to be rude. You know, it was a really good programme. But I think people were watching it because they were actually quite frightened. I, I have met people who are really frightened about the future on all sorts of sides. Um, so... I'm going to go to Mark about the comparisons and then I'm going to open it up to the floor. So if you have your questions ready. Well, I, I mean, <coughs> I'm not saying anything that you don't know already. I mean, what, what's obviously happened is that the uh, conflation, as it were, of the Brexit issue with the rise of identity politics in any event uh, is much more complicated to deal with because trying to define what is both quality journalism and impartial journalism no longer can take at its central point the political parties and understandings about the way socioeconomic class and even geographical location maps onto views. Mm -hmm. And you're now dealing with something more visceral than that, which is who are we exactly? Uh, and it can't, and it, it's also obviously Polly's point about mm -hmm. clashes of different interpretations of democracy. Again, this is not a new point. Is it plebiscitary democracy because we handed it over in 2016 to that? Mm -hmm. Or is it in fact parliamentary democracy in which that can be argued with? And Dorothy's point, we didn't actually know in detail what it is that was going to come out of it. So if you put all of that together with a sustained length of time and the Westminster drama multiplied by the fact that it's more or less uh, a hung parliament or certainly a minority government, which gives it rocket-propelled interest, theatre, occasional triviality, but absolutely vital in terms of determining an outcome, you get a, a mix of ingredients which is absolutely fascinating for those of us interested in it extraordinary dramatic and theatrical, absolutely extraordinarily important for the future of the country and unknowable. You put all of that together and you get what you've got now. Yes, I look back to that day when um, we were all gathered around the TVs waiting for the vote for um, uh, Jim Callaghan. He lost by one vote and resigned. And that seems a very, very distant, uh, <laughs> uh, distant uh, place uh, to be. Uh, anyway, uh, questions uh, from uh, the floor. Just uh, get a show of hands. We've got microphones, um, I think, yes. Over there, we'll start on this side and work our way across. So, um, yes, first uh, to you. Yeah, lovely, thanks, yeah. Uh, Michael Barton, I used to be involved with local radio for the BBC. The radio stations are 50 years old. And uh, going back to the Brexit argument, I mean, throughout Brexit, uh, running up to uh, where the BBC treated it like a, a general election, they didn't seem to have uh, clearly defined rules of engagement for a referendum which was about people rather than politicians. And those local radio stations were having conversations with people, real people, uh, who created all the surprises that we now know about. Why did they vote in the northeast to go this way and why did they vote this way in the southwest? Uh, those views were being expressed on a daily basis through those local radio stations. And the BBC radio networks didn't tap into that. That was a terrible mistake. It wasn't a question of bias. It was a lack of imagination on the part of the, the producers concerned. And meanwhile, television was uh, gracing, its present, gracing the presence of people like David Dimbleby had parachuted into Barry and Furness and, and uh, Truro and so on. But we didn't get real people again. Put Dick Robinson on a train from Scotland down to Peterborough, and he'd hop off for a few minutes and chat to the first people he saw. And that was one of their ways of engaging with the real uh, members of the public, about which Brexit was certainly uh, the defining moment. And Do you that's, have an actual question, emissions. or is that just a comment? Because, um, yeah. lovely, that's great. We'll take that as a comment, unless anybody... I'd love to say something to about Vox yeah. Pops. Okay, uh, yeah. I would absolutely stop Vox Pops altogether. <laughs> Stone dead. <laughs> Every night, I want to throw my shoes at the television, Vox Pops that are meaningless. Vox Pops have meaning if you talk to somebody engaged in something relevant, talking about their specialist subject. You talk to, uh, you know, a farmer about what it's going to do for his sheep or his cows, that's a relevant Vox Pop. Talking to people in the street, 
where, you know, you get one of these, one of those. Uh, I'm trying to find somebody who says something daft and funny too. Um, and it, it's, you know, that it is really, really infuriating because you know it's just cherry picking. I know as a reporter, I go out, I was in Middlesbrough yesterday talking to all sorts of people. You can just cherry pick anything you want. You can craft anything you want you, uh, out of uh, random quotes, and they are meaningless. And I wish the BBC would you, band them don't, all don't together. Dorothy, I think you podcast. make a very interesting point there, and in um, some of our special referendum debates, what we tried to do was make the politicians um, sit with a, an expert audience so that we didn't have people just as a vox pop, but said to a farmer, you, you know, going to your point, you, you are an expert farmer, or you're, a, I mean, the world's full of experts. So the way um, broadcasting is too much is the idea that the journalists and the politicians are the experts and the whole of the rest of the population are just a bunch of vox pops. When in real life, if you really needed a problem answered, no offence meant to ourselves. Would it be journalists and politicians <laughs> that you went to? No, it would be all those people with great expertise. And briefly, to your point about people from London getting on a train, absolutely. I mean, I started at Granada in Manchester, and it's why I really, really believe that Channel 4 moving to Leeds and Glasgow and Bristol is actually way long overdue, which it's going to do. Thanks, Michael. Uh, yes, questions mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Peter Mahaffey. Um, perhaps I was one of those who didn't have the courage to put my hand up when you asked if there was bias. Um, I feel that there is an almost subliminal raised bar uh, towards anybody who expresses a pro-European sympathy uh, at the BBC. It's, it's not uh, overt, but I think you see it in a lot of Newsnight. I think you see it uh, from Evan Davies. I think you see it from John Humphreys. Uh, I, I just think the bar is set higher for those who express a pro-European uh, uh, ethos. Um, in contrast, there seems almost to be um, a kind of sneaking admiration for the colourful characters uh, on the hard uh, Brexit side. Perhaps they, they're, they're better, um, better cover. Um, but you don't see this kind of thing, in my personal view, uh, on Channel 4. And I think the BBC just needs to be a little bit careful about this, this uh, subliminal uh, uh, higher bar for pro-Europeans. If it's subliminal, you're receiving the s it, but um, you sort of notice it, but you can't quite pin down what it is? Well, I could have brought examples. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you've got an example, that would be really good. Yeah. Don't worry if you don't, and then I'll put it to Mark. I'll, I'll, I'll leave put it to that. Mark. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Um, there's an astonishing bit in Sir Craig Oliver's book, um, his diaries, which he kept during the referendum campaign. It's, it's on page four or five of the first edition. Um, he spends a lot of the rest of the book complaining uh, about the BBC. Um, on page five, he says something in terms like this. This is going to be, and he, it's allegedly and probably is a contemporaneous diary entry, so in the run up to the vote itself. And fairly early on, he said, This is going to be an extremely hard vote to win. Uh, we have basically been extraordinarily rude and abrasive uh, about the European Union for the last 25 years, and we're now going to have to spend the next few weeks turning it around and persuading people that on balance it's a good idea. Uh, Gordon Brown, when he had the opportunity to take part in the Nobel Prize, thought that he shouldn't quite grace it with a photo opportunity. Tony Blair is probably the nearest you've got to any mainstream politician uh, as Prime Minister who was prepared to say something good about the European Union. Uh, that was inevitably a hugely important force in the way that debate was shaped because the inability of people articulately to defend Britain's membership with anything that looked like real passion up against what Farage and co was doing was a sort of mismatch. Um, and that's a force outside the BBC's control about the choice of political language and political rhetoric. And as for the BBC itself and Evan and John, I, I've heard of all of that. Um, I can't find any very obvious examples. I can see any number of interviews where I might have asked the question differently, but I don't detect the pattern that you detect. <laughs>
we, we get, um, yes, P Peter at uh, the back. Peter York. Peter York. When Torin asked us all whether we felt there was bias at the BBC, we fell silent because that's a bridge too far. That's the stuff of news what and biased BBC and ban the BBC and all those extraordinary YouTube phenomena, which I trust everyone here has got across because they're extraordinary. However, at the same time, uh, and this is the question, does that absolve the BBC by saying it's not biased in any crude and obvious way it's regulated, it, and you know, there are endless flagellation sessions inside the BBC about bias. It's not the same as saying, one, there's too much Westminster. Do you know, we're looking at a big nationwide, continent-wide problem, and there's too much Westminster. There's hours of Westminster, and the minutiae of Westminster and the numbers of Westminster and people get bored stiff and can't relate to it. It's because there's been too much Westminster that you know, the Great Peasants Revolt has happened. There's also palpably on the BBC an agenda set by national newspapers. And the national newspapers are shriekingly, utterly biased. It doesn't take very much analysis to say that. Everyone knows that. And if you're setting a panel where you've got somebody from the Spectator, somebody from the Telegraph, maybe somebody from the FT, that isn't very, very representative. So there are, I mean, chances missed there, and there are big issues avoided. So people tell me on a daily basis, very, very big issues avoided because they're too uncomfortable. Thank you. Dorothy, how did Channel 4 deal with those things? Or do you agree that the BBC has I, I think them? people are raising really interesting issues. I find, in general, having been a journalist for a very long time, that British people have a tendency to view everything too much from a British perspective. So they... And that, that really played into the limitations of some of the debate during the referendum. I mean, the obvious one is when people say we have the best policemen in the world. And I always say, gosh, I wish I'd studied all the policemen in the whole world and could make that statement. How do I know whether the police are great in Honolulu? I literally don't know. So when we discuss the NHS, it's a bit like when you discuss the BBC. Oh, God, if you say anything about the NHS, you're either for the NHS or against the NHS. Why? C we need to have more discussions. Like, have you noticed the way that the French do GP referrals? Because it's really interesting, and it may be rather good, and perhaps we should have something like that. And uh, it, it's very easy for us as journalists to um, attack the European... Union, you know, throughout my career, I can send people off and find fake olive oil factories in Sicily and men with baseball bats come out and it's really great. But does that mean that the entire Italian economy has nothing at all to teach me? Um, and so is Channel 4 News the place or dispatches? Where would you do All of it. All of it. I think um, we, we need to... Whatever happens, we need to understand the politics and the economies of our European neighbours much better because it will be to our advantage to know some of the really great and interesting things that they do. And, and people just didn't... What was this Europe? I, don't even, I didn't even know sometimes when people refer to Europe, I'm against Europe, well... It's a geographical entity. I, 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 you, so what is it you're against? People were confused. Polly, can you address Peter's, um, because you were at the BBC, the, the BBC um, being driven by the newspaper's agendas? I think it's very unconscious because, uh, as Mark says, you know, they're bright, alert people. 
But if you're sitting in a morning news conference and you're looking, what are you looking for? You're looking at, well, the overnight log of what people have said. N normally, not very many. I don't know whether many more do these days since bre Brexit, but when I was in the newsroom, there were really rather few. So if you've got a few calls on something, you'd kind of respond to that. But it's not necessarily the right thing to respond to. Uh, certainly try not to respond to the sun, the star, the express, the mail, the telegraph. Um, and try not to respond to the right-wing ones. Well, you, with the, the weight of them against, you know, the FT, pretty reasonable, um, independent and Guardian, um, but the sheer weight of and the noise of them uh, but on the other hand, you do know that in Downing Street, when you hear people talking about Downing Street in the Blair years, they were looking at those things and worrying about them. They're not irrelevant. They are part of the political scene as well. And if they get going on a campaign, sure enough, the broadcasters very often will get dragged into it, whatever it might be. You might be a day or two late, but you get pulled in by it. I mean, they are a huge megaphone in this country that can't be ignored as part of the political climate, horrible though it often is. I'm going to um, try and move back to the floor because we've still got some uh, questions. If, so we can have uh, one... Uh, I'll take t those two uh, the gentlemen there uh, and see whether they're at all relevant to each other. Before. Thank you. Robert Beveridge, University of Sassari and VLV. I'd like to address Mark Damazer's point about fact-checking and give a very brief example of where the BBC got it right and it got it wrong at the same time. And inevitably it involves Donald Trump and his lies. And he made the claim that uh, the energy needs of Germany coming from Russia were 60 or 70 percent of Germany's energy needs. Now to be fair to the BBC, it was the six o'clock news on Radio 4, they had a fact checker a bit later. And the fact checker made the point that it's 60 to 70% of Germany's gas needs, which are 20% of Germany's energy needs. So there you've got a lie by Donald Trump. Not a big surprise, but the problem was that was the headline, and most people only listen to the headline and not further on to get the fact checking. We had the same problem during the Scottish referendum. Typically the BBC would start with the no campaign and then put the yes campaign afterwards. And so how would your idea of fact-checking enable the BBC to call out lies at the point of communication? I'll, I'll answer that, yeah. yeah. Um, well, uh, it goes like this. Um, uh, the internet has infinite space, um, and you can find out all of this sort of stuff uh, if your finger leads you to the right place. And it's far from being the BBC. The BBC was not the first to do it. I salute Channel 4, full fact and various others, and they're all pretty good, and the IFS is more than pretty good, so it's all out there. Uh, so the question is, and it's quite a demanding question, I don't say this because it's anything other than uh, risk territory to begin with, how do you integrate it to get maximum impact to be something that corrects the incorrect factual statement as early as you can? Now, a lot of stories that come up are actually quite predictable. Um, if you have a big uh, health minister on in 10 past 8 in the morning on one Radio 4, you roughly know what the contours of that interview are likely to be. If you have a unit that knows its facts in advance, uh, it can prepare a brief and could be on air certainly by the end of the programme and possibly even before to provide the correction. You'd have to pilot this in my view because you can see how it might go wrong and it will on occasion. But something has to be done to get the correct version or the best approximate version of correct around facts and figures into the mainstream of the program. That's my objection. And if what you say is right, and I missed it, that by the end of the program, when Trump had made the mistaken claim about Germany's energy consumption, they got it out by the end of the program. That's very fast and good work. So let's start with that. It doesn't even have to be immediately after the item. You may as well have it at least at the end of the program, but you label it and you protect it and that the listener or the viewer knows it's coming. And that in and of itself will change the behaviour of both the politician and the person who's preparing the brief because they will know that they can't get away with it. And so everybody will raise their game accordingly. Thank you it might very not much. change Thank Donald you. Trump. We've got a microphone there first. Yeah, yeah. Vincent Porter, VLV. <coughs> In a fortnight's time, we have elections to the European Parliament. Mm 
could I ask each of the speakers what strategy they would be putting in place to ensure fair, accurate and impartial coverage? Dorothy. Well, we are fortunate in having an hour a night to give us that space because I think all television journalists that I know want fair, accurate and duly impartial reporting and it's, it's the thing they struggle for every day. We get into a lot of trouble if we don't do it. Um, I think our strategy should be as much as possible to examine the real issues and to put those, as someone has said, at length to politicians rather than just hear lots of people speaking. But a real issue we've got, and I know that others have got it, is that politicians no longer want to do long, in-depth interviews. And they say that on Channel 4, um, if you come on, we've got an hour. We could talk to you for half an hour of that. And I know that um, several senior politicians have said, I won't go on Channel 4 News because I will be interviewed at great length. And some of you may have noticed that this year at the Tory party conference, I believe for the first time, um, the British Prime Minister wouldn't do an interview with Channel 4 or Channel 5. And I think that's very, very sad for democracy. Polly, briefly, do you, would you have a strategy for the EU elections? Yes, I mean, I'd want a, a, a lesser emphasis on rowdy rallies, because you can always do lots of rowdy rallies with, uh, and get your supporters around, and it doesn't tell you very much. I want much more. I want to hear in detail from the people most affected. I want the stories from the food and drink manufacturers, very particular, about their waiting on a knife edge for what's going to happen. I mean, let's face it, this is a proxy. This is a proxy second referendum, and it will be treated as such. And all of the people waiting on a knife edge about how it's going to affect them, their business, their families, whoever it might be, I want to hear the most possible for in every walk of life of people directly, personally affected by what the result's going to be. Mark. Well, it's very difficult. I'll give a rather different answer um, because there is an instrumental functional challenge, which is how to balance competing political parties uh, and how much weight and measure you give uh, at its most banal, to the most banal form, which is party election broadcasts and rather more seriously within news and current affairs programmes. Uh, there is a formula, I'm sure the BBC uh, has published it, uh, Ofcom will have published it, which explains that it's broadly speaking two electoral cycles that determine the weight that's given to individual political parties in the run-up to an election of this kind. Uh, and then you have to add a couple of factors in, like change has been created and what do we do with them. Uh, but that actually does count for something. People are running broadly on party labels and don't dismiss it. So getting that as right as you can matters. Now we come to the other point, which is that there are several positions floating around here. Uh, second referendum, let's get out altogether hard, let's go for some fudge around a customs union. Um, uh, let's get back in as soon as we can. Uh, and in some way, anybody doing uh, uh, over a course of a three or four week campaign a set of agendas needs to be very mindful of the exposure and crucially the scrutiny and criticism of those positions over the course of a campaign so that they have what appears to be a, a reasonable and approximate amount of exposure. And then the obvious point, which we've been making, I think, collectively throughout, which is that there are genuine issues out there. They're not vox pop, but there are people affected by it. You need to get that expertise grafted into mainstream agendas. Thank you very much. I'm afraid it's 11.30. We have reached the end of time. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are staying and will be there to talk to people uh, over lunch, but uh, it's obviously been a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much for the panel. Thank you. Thank you.